So presidents, uh, ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have very uh, distinguished speakers with, her, uh, with us here today. Uh, I feel very lucky to uh, discuss the future with these uh, distinguished uh, thinkers and visionaries. Uh, if we think about a little bit what's ahead of us, uh, we need to plan ahead. We need to have a clear view of what will take place in the future to make the right choices today. Uh, the Prime Minister of Iceland touched upon uh, a true visionary this morning, uh, Wilhelmur Stefansson. Uh, Wilhelmur actually ha was a holder of three Arctic passports. He was born by Icelandic parents in Canada, and then he emigrated to the US. But he was a true visionary. Uh, he foresaw changes in aviation. He pre befriended uh, Wright brothers, uh, Lindbergh, and 100 years ago, he was forecasting uh, the transpolar flights. Uh, he helped the uh, US government uh, making the first plans for such flights. He uh, was a consultant to Pan Am for the first commercial transpolar flights. And uh, most of you sort of enjoyed that his vision materialized when you arrived here today in Iceland or yesterday. The reason is that Iceland Air has basically put his vision into practice. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, they started working under the same premises as Stefansson has forecasted 100 years ago. And that totally transformed their business. So today, uh, this year, there will probably be around 4 million passengers flying through Keplavik Airport. One million will stop by in Iceland as tourists, but three are in transit. So they will basically use an airport of a town which has 14,000 inhabitants. So these opportunities, very few people foresaw in the past, but they're real, they materialized, and there are many more opportunities like this. Uh, with me here today, uh, I have Miko Merot from Polarisk, which is going to present some of the key findings of his very interesting report, The Arctic in 2035, and uh, the distinguished professors, Lauren Smith and Lawson Brigham. So, Miko, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, good morning. So today I will, I will be guiding you through, as uh, Heather said, uh, our report, uh, which is basically on the future of the Arctic. And our report is called the Arctic Handbook. I will guide you through it. So I'm from Polarisk. Polarisk is the first and only so far, maybe it will change in the future, but only so far, uh, consultancy that's working on microeconomics and political risk in the Arctic and Antarctic only. Uh, what we do today, is basically trying to understand where is the Arctic going in the time of climate change. Basically, this is a session about what's going to be happening in 20 years in the Arctic. But what has happened in the past 20 years? Well, on that slide you saw how the Arctic is going to change from a climatology perspective between, 2000, between 1995, where the, where the, when the Arctic Council did not exist, and 2035. But as we put in the Arctic Handbook, it goes more than it goes much beyond uh, climatology and climate change and everything. I'm going to present you what we and what other people think of the world in 2035. So let me start with a couple of figures. So first of all, what is going to be the world population in 2035? Well, the UN says between eight and nine billion people. Then what is going to be the global GDP? In, 2030, in 2035. Well, in 2015, next year, uh, it's going to be, according to the IMF, 81 trillions. Well, in 2035, it will be 210 tri trillions. If we think about energy, what is going to be the global primary uh, energy demand around the world? Well, technically, from now on to 2035, BP forecasts an, uh, an increase by 42% of the demand. And just another one. What is going to be the oil price in 2035? If you think about the Arctic, we of course think about natural resources, oil and gas exploration, and so on. Well, technically, if we keep uh, business as usual, well, the oil, the oil will, uh, the barrel of oil will cost uh, $135. Uh, well, if we impl implement new policies at the global level, it could go down to 100 and, 
$13. Well, if we stand to a 450 scenarios, so a scenario in which we implement, we as the world, uh, we implement new policies, but also new technologies uh, that will help reduce our carbon footprint, then the oil, the barrel of oil will would be $90 in 2035. So that's from the IEA. And then you have one last thing. How does climate change and change in the Arctic express itself from a geostrategic, a geopolitical, and a geoeconomic perspective? Well, that's, one, that's what we are answering uh, in the reports. So technically, when we think about the Arctic in 2035, there is one coin word to remember. Sisungutinik, which means adaptation, or to adapt oneself. Inuktitut. And we're going to be talking about adaptation today. So what we see in the Arctic is two phases of development. The first phase is the phase between 2015 and 2025 to 28, which we call the Arctic construction era, in which we, have, in which we see a development of infrastructure, development of institutions, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. And then between 2025, 28, and 2013 and beyond, you have the Arctic boom era. The Arctic boom era from a political perspective, from an, economic, from an economic perspective and from an innovation perspective. We'll be dealing with that. So the first thing we had to do is develop a definition of the Arctic market. What is the Arctic market right now? Well, the Arctic market, you could argue, and I think our fellows here will argue, uh, that it, it limits itself to the Arctic countries. Well, we go much, be uh, much uh, beyond that, actually. What we, did, what we did was develop a new geoeconomic based definition of what the Arctic market is, will be in 2035. And so in order to compare numbers between 2035 and 2015, well, you'll see the difference it makes between $620 billion today of GDP to up to $2 billion, $2 trillion in 2035. But what is the Arctic market? So the Arctic market is not just the Arctic countries. Of course, you have Alaska, you have Greenland, Kalanat, you have Iceland, you have Finland, which is the only European country that says that its whole, its whole territory is an Arctic territory because it's above the 60, uh, 60 degrees latitude. And then you have other kind of players like the Faroe Islands, like France with the, uh, the saint pierre miquelon archipelago. You have Sweden, you have Russia, and you have parts of northern, of northeast China. We will get into it. This is what it looks like. The Arctic market right now, in 2035, but that we've st started studying right now, looks like this. And so we're going to be providing you two case studies today. So the first one is shipping. As it interests a lot of people, well, what we see is that in 2035, there could be kind of weekly service between Murmansk and Tianjin. Of course, that's a little bit provocative to put it like this, but from a more serious perspective here, this is what the Arctic uh, shipping series will, will look like in 2035. So you, of course, you have the Northern Sea Route on the Russian side. You have the Arctic Bridge between North America and Europe. And then you have the Northwest Passage in Canada. But you have also these transpolar routes, which cannot be used today because there's too much ice on the road. And you have people like the NVGL, like the European Commission, who have tried to assess the number of, of ships that would go uh, through these routes that cannot be uh, sailed <clears throat> today. But what are our figures for 2014 as a reference? So the figures are simple, and that's from October 14. Well, until at, uh, as of October 14, there were 28 transits on the Northern Sea Route, held by Jose Tom Flood. Well, the season is not ended, of course, and we expect at Polaris, we estimate that there might be a 29 to 32 transits this year, which is a dramatic decrease compared to last year. A dramatic decrease which is not explained by politics, which is not explained by economics per se, it's basically very simple. There was, there was just too much ice on the Northern Sea Route this year. But nonetheless, by 2035, we expect to, uh, to see more than 30 new Arctic-related hubs, what we call Arctic-related hubs, can be global hubs like Mormonsk, for example, like Kirkness, but it can be also local hubs. So here in Iceland, we see three hubs, three main hubs emerging. Reykjavik, of course, Akureyri, of course, and Finnafjordur, which is developing uh, right now. But beyond the, Iceland, beyond the Icelandic fate in the Arctic, of course, you have a lot of ports, harbors that will be developed in Russia and in many other parts uh, of the Arctic, as you can see. So going to, the, to our figures in 2035, what we see at Polarisk is that 
up to 19% of China's exports could go through the Arctic. We can discuss this figure later, I guess, because China in the Arctic and China in the Arctic shipping sector uh, will be a major issue or major newcomer uh, in, the, in the years to come. What we see as well is that we can expect up to 50% market share on north-north shipments, that is, on shipments that come from a harbor that's north of the 40 degrees uh, parallel north, and that go to another harbor that's above uh, the 14 degrees parallel as well. And another thing, a lot of people say that the NSR, the West Northwest Passage, could have a strong impact on Panama, on Suez, and all that. What, what we see is that the impact would be very little. The reason to this is very simple. It's not just because in the Arctic you won't have that much cargo and you will have more bulk and all that, but the main, issue, the main thing to understand is that the Arctic will not cannibalize the Suez and Panama markets. The Arctic will create its own market with its own players and will basically expand uh, the global shipping market rather than cannibalizing another part of the world. And so we are basically aligned when it comes to, uh, we're basically aligned with uh, the European Commission and with the NVGL when we think about how many ships could sail through the Arctic by 2035. Well, we think about more than 2,000 uh, could be a good figure. And again, just to finish with shipping, the main hubs, what would the main hubs would be? Well, Murmansk Kirkness is, a, is an absolute, uh, an absolute uh, reality. And it's emerging right now, since we are in the Arctic construction era. But then you have another hub, another hub that is Iceland. And we'll get to it uh, in the conclusion. Iceland is not just a sum of hubs that will happen. As I said, there were gonna, there's going to be three main hubs, main, main harbor uh, in, in Iceland. No, it's just Iceland itself can be the hub. But beyond shipping, so what we have also is new technologies, new sectors uh, that emerge in the Arctic. So the first one can be farming. What you see here is Greenland. That's kind of counterintuitive. Well, basically, you can, what you can expect is that you have a lot more farming and growing that happens in the Arctic uh, as the global warming uh, arises. Then the second thing is uh, the fiber optic sector, the data center sector. And again, Iceland, Greenland, Finland, a lot of countries in the Arctic can benefit from that sector. That's quite lucrative. Another one uh, which will mostly benefit to, to Svalbard, Greenland, or even Alaska, uh, could be the space sector. And we can to that, get to that again uh, later on. But beyond that, as I said, there's going to be new innovations. And new innovations can take many forms. Well, we've spotted a couple of companies, new young entrepreneurs, uh, that are actually building some very interesting uh, things for the Arctic. What you see here is the Arctic Floating City project by a young Canadian uh, who basically said, well, why don't we put some autonomous cities in the international waters of the Arctic? Why don't we do that? And then you have another French uh, team of students uh, who said, well, what we could do is basically harvest, uh, harvest iceberg uh, within a structure that's man-made and then develop many things out of that. Well, what we see is that there will be a lot of new uh, sectors, new industries that will emerge in the Arctic, and we try to, to quantify the emergence of those in our report. And there is one key other thing when it comes to geopolitics. I will get into the Russian question to, be, to, 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 to end this, uh, this talk. But the other great political thing in the Arctic is Greenland, or otherwise known as Kalalit Kali Nunat. Will it be independent? Can it be independent? Well, what we, see, what we see is that if Greenland builds an economic strategy, an economic recipe that is sound, sustainable, and that makes use of all these new industries that are going to be emerging in the Arctic, and if it can use the West Nordic uh, framework to actually develop itself, regionally speaking, if it can develop a strong hedging strategy at a global level, thanks to uranium, thanks to many things, well, Greenland could very well be independent by 2035. Because what we are building here is scenarios. At Polar Risk, we work out of seven scenarios, and then an eighth one, uh, which we'll, we will get into, I think, during the discussion. Uh, but so the, the message that's important beyond this idea of adaptation is that the Arctic is really what you make of it. And that's why we work out of scenarios. We cannot predict. No one can predict. What we can say is that you, as Arctic stakeholders, you can make use of those scenarios to either follow them, if you're interested in them, or actually impact them to change the Arctic to make it look like what you would like. 
So that's kind of what the Russians are doing right now. And the Primakov Doctrine uh, is kind of a new term uh, that we're trying to coin in the report. Uh, basically, it's based on uh, the work of, uh, of uh, Yevgeny Primakov. Uh, and basically, he was the one uh, around the years 1997, 1998, who said, well, this idea that Russia should copy the West just doesn't match the Russian society. And so Russia should be independent in its foreign policy. He didn't say that Russia should be uh, imperialistic, expansionist. He said that it should be independent and think independently. And well, as we see in this, on this map, if Russia actually builds all the, the, the SNR and military centers that it wants to build that President Putin has announced in the Arctic, well, its projection capability could be strong in the Arctic. But we don't say that when it comes to China and Russia coming to the Arctic, it's going to be for a military showdown. Of course, uh, the Chinese military expenditure by 2035 can reach, at current trends, 100% uh, of that of the US. And that's, of course, uh, a very strong element to take into account when we study defense and security related investments in the Arctic up to 2035. We have three scenarios. You have the numbers over here. Well, basically, scenario five, we'll get into that, is the militarization one. But that's not the one that's actually the most robust. Bottom line is, in 2025, this may be more than just an exercise. There will not be a war for the Arctic, but should there be a conflict, it can very well happen in the Arctic at some point. And that's why we need cooperation, and the Arctic Council is doing a great work. On this side, you have the timeline of the Arctic Council's chairmanships, and you have potential new applicants. When we say potential new applicants, it's people that we have identified as new applicants, or people who are actually building their program right now and which will send their application in the next years to come. So you can see that you have many countries, of course not from the Arctic, but not even from the near or sub-Arctic. So what is, what is this all about is mutations. Mutations in every kind of way. So in the report, the Polaris Arctic Handbook 2015 edition, we guide you through those mutations. And we hope that the figures that we've put in the report can actually help you stakeholders, whether you're from an economic background, whether you're an administration, whether you're a country, whatever, can help you understand where the Arctic is going so that you can act on it. So basically, it's available right now on our website, polarisk-group.com slash shop. And today, if you buy it uh, in the next few, in the next few uh, days, actually, if you use the coupon Arctic Circle, you will get 20% rebate. Yeah, it's good, it's good to say it, right? And I would like to conclude this, uh, this discussion uh, and hand, the, hand the, the floor back to our panelists, our mighty panelists, uh, by talking about Iceland just for a very, very uh, short time. Yes, in 2035, this Arctic land, because it's not a sub-Arctic land, is a world-class hub. It is a world-class hub. And that's what we're seeing. That's why we are building geoeconomic perspectives for the Arctic and for Iceland. And we're very glad, very, very glad. And thank you again, President Grimson, and all those who've made it possible uh, that we are presenting this groundbreaking work today here in Iceland. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mika. So I want to start with Lawson and give the floor to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I think my, Mika and his team uh, are attempting to, of course, address the complexity of, of the Arctic. And uh, here, here at the beginning of the 21st century, we have uh, clearly profound uh, climate change, and that's uh, every event we go to we hear about. Uh, but we also have clearly a new globalization of the Arctic, uh, the linkage of Arctic natural resources uh, to global markets, and I think uh, Mika and his team have captured that pretty well. Uh, we also have a whole set, and we hear all the time, the Arctic Council and most venues, a whole set of Arctic indigenous peoples issues. And then uh, finally, of course, the Arctic is linked to the world in geopolitics, but linked also regionally in, in an intriguing geopolitical dimension of the uh, adjudication of the seabed. How this all plays out to 2035, how these interrelate with overlaying technological change is what Mika has also added to this equation, uh, is, is hugely complex. Lots of wild cards, I think, is the message. Just, just one point about the shipping, I think that uh, Mika captures this well. Everyone that works on this problem in depth, particularly the maritime industry, 
sees no new globalization, no re retooling of the global trade routes to the Arctic, what they see is new supplemental opportunities, and, and that's what Mika has pointed to. No, no one really believes we're going to take over all the trade that happens on the planet through the Panama Canal, even the new Panama Canal, and through the Suez Canal, even the new Suez Canal, I'll bet before uh, 2035. <clears throat> so the Arctic shipping is an add-on. Great opportunities, and certainly uh, dominated by destinational shipping of Arctic natural resources to the planet. And, and no one really can forecast exactly what the niche markets might be for container shipping. Clearly there are opportunities, but all of this navigation is still seasonal. The place is ice covered, or fully or partially, for nine, nine and a half months a year, through the century and beyond. We know the ice is thinner, less extent, but it's still there, and it is a considerable barrier for uh, trans shipping. So uh, I think Mika's approach to this as a supplemental, Arctic shipping in particular, as a supplemental to global shipping is right on the money. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Lawrence, do you have comments? Sure. Um, uh, like Lawson, I appreciated the, the touch of reality about the Northern Sea Route. Um, the, the statement that it would be always negligible relative to Suez and Panama traffic, that's absolutely true. I think when we plot these transits and talk about how the number of transits has increased 50% from the year before or what have you, it's just important to keep in mind that the total number going through that route for the entire shipping season is on the same scale as one day of traffic through the Suez Canal. And Suez operates year-round. So I appreciated that, that touch of... of um, pragmatism in the talk. I also appreciated what I think the talk does very well, which is to summon some of the excitement and passion about the future potentialities and, and um, opportunities that may lie in this region. Some pragmatic, um, others quite, you know, quite out there, like, like farming, for example, or um, uh, you know, space gateways and new technologies. This is exciting, and I think this, this benefits the, this community to, to um, have that kind of excitement. That said, there's also a risk that it plays into one of the broader problems that the Arctic has globally, which is that it is perceived as somehow this, this blank slate. It, it is perceived as this place that the Arctic is what you make it. When in fact it isn't. It's very, um, it, it's, as all in this room know, uh, there are many very real limitations of the place. It's extremely well governed, has been for a long time. This is not a, a pallet, uh, not, not quite the blank slate, that sometimes um, this kind of excitement can, can go too far. So the, the limitations and the very serious problems shouldn't be glossed over, nor the the interests of the people who have lived there for, for millennia. So I hope we can um, maintain that balance in this panel as we balance both the exciting opportunities with the, the very pragmatic concerns moving yeah. forward. Yeah, there was one concern that uh, President uh, Sauli Ninistu from Finland this morning brought up uh, regarding the trade restrictions with Russia. And uh, you, you mentioned one scenario that you didn't go into deeply, the militarized yeah. scenario. So, so what's your view on that? Well, our view is that the military scenario is the, le the least robust of our eight. Uh, what we're thinking is that when we think about the Arctic in terms of uh, security, well, it's more about SNR. It's more about search and rescue. It's more about securing the development of the Arctic rather than securitization for a military purpose. So this fifth scenario, which is the militarization of the Arctic, of course, Russia leads the way because Russia has tremendous expertise in the Arctic. Russia has been an Arctic country since 1478. Uh, uh, that, that's kind of what I say every time. So Russia is here. America is over there. But America doesn't put any money in the Arctic right now. And I think uh, we, we didn't get the chance to, to hear Amira Pab just before. Uh, and that's sad. But at the same time, we kind of know where America is going. That is, well, the Congress is not really willing to, to invest the money it would need uh, if it America would compete with Russia over time in the Arctic. And there's something, there's something else. The, the other factor is China. 
China, of course, wants to secure its territory. But China has a different geostrategic perspective from ours, ours as Westerners. China believes that, China believes, it's hard to put it this way, but you get the idea. Uh, in China, you have a lot of academics who believe that the Arctic can be a tool to a securitization of the, of the Chinese territory. They believe that through the Arctic and the Antarctic, you could control space, or you could have actually a better hand on what's happening in space. And that's where the, that's where the thinking comes in. They believe that they cannot compete with the West, broadly speaking, in terms of air, land, and sea. So they think about going up north or up above, uh, up to space, to actually make sure that their are now, now we're going into the next session, basically, awesome. which is the Arctic from space. So if we can keep it to the planet, sort of. <laughs> and, and do you comment? Can you comment on? Yeah, the sure. I, 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 I didn't hear uh, Japan and Korea in the discussion, and I, I suspect. Uh, having dealt with both countries and a wide range of issues, that they'll be uh, maritime players themselves. Maybe niche markets clearly move in natural resources, but if you look today in the world, who's building uh, Arctic-going ships, it's, it's, it's Korea. It's not China, it's not even Japan. Japan is building a few ice-breaking ships, but it's really Korea has a niche market here. So my guess is that uh, uh, there are a full range of players there are a lot of wild cards, of course, in, as there are in doing the scenarios process and trying to kind of look at the future uh, from nuclear energy to indigenous issues. And, and we don't know when they're going to pop up. One popped up recently, right? Oil today is $85 a barrel. Very few people suspected that it would be so low today. When we, just a comment about the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment the Arctic Council produced. During the length of this study, we started out with this study $140 a barrel. When we ended the study, it was 57. Just that one driver would affect marine transportation in the Arctic. Real wild card, very uh, dynamic. So there are lots of wild cards, and, and we're having them even today. Lawrence? Well, and some of these wild cards aren't being discussed enough, in my opinion. Um, for example, um, Senator Murkowski referred today of uh, the two Arctics in the context of development, a well-developed Arctic versus a non, uh, a, a, the remainder, which is in desperate need of infrastructure, improved infrastructure, for example. But there's another two Arctics that's spoken about very little, um, the, the marine versus the land. I mean, the Arctic has a lot of land, and most of the the talks and the media hype that we read about in the reports really focus on the marine future of this place. And, and that's probably appropriate because the future of this place is marine because the benefits that transportation, for example, will not be realized on land. In fact, quite the opposite. The landscape will be debilitated by future climate change in response in the high, in the high Arctic to threat of thawing permafrost. Uh, especially places that have a lot of ice in the ground. Um, this is damaging to infrastructure. Uh, it also p poses a potential long-term threat to the planet from increased methane emissions. Uh, and more broadly, even south of the Arctic, uh, to temporary winter roads, which, as people who live in, say, northern Alberta know very well, there are many industries and ac human activities that can only happen thanks to these winter roads. So there's a dichotomy there that uh, one half of which is, is too often missing from, from the debates in this room. And it will impact, particularly with regard to resource extraction, it, that will enter the picture as, for example, in Russia, in the Russian Far East, if those commodities are to go to China, they need to be transferred from the land to the ports. Mm -hmm. So a broad-based discussion uh, I think would be beneficial as opposed to focusing too much on, on certain areas. Yeah, Lawson. Just a quick comment about, we'll hear throughout this conference this uh, loaded term, confusing term, infrastructure, what does it mean? But clearly there's a need for public-private partnerships. I mean, it's very clear because the Arctic states themselves are not going to develop all of this infrastructure, particularly related to even marine safety and environmental protection. It has to be in union w w with the commercial world. And some people actually say, Lawrence, that we are now entering a cooling period because we've seen the sea ice grow 2013, 2014. What's your, what's your response to that? Oh, I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to, uh, to speak to that. I'm sure um, Don Gunnar Winther may later in his pre presentation as well. Uh, over the short term, Arctic climate is a bit like the stock market. It will have corrections and pauses and so forth. Uh, there are many drivers of 
climate system and sea ice conditions in the Arctic. But the secular trend, the long-term trend of increased warming of the planet's energy balance, which is amplified in the Arctic, is absolutely unequivocal. The physics of the greenhouse warming have been known since a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius worked them out longhand in 1893. If you increase the concentration of these gases in the atmosphere, on average, the temperature must go up. And so these short-term pauses it, it, um, should not, and it's almost irresponsible to, to overplay them uh, in face of the long-term okay. um, That's short-term. We were talking long-term, and uh, you were mentioning huge investments coming in. So if we just go back to your report, uh, where would you foresee that these investments come from mostly? Well, going back to the climate change question mm -hmm. for just okay. one second, this is one of the scenarios we've tested, actually. We work, as I said, out of eight scenarios, seven of which are based on the idea that Larry just mentioned that the Arctic will grow over time, uh, that the Arctic will, uh, will melt, sorry, over time. And the eighth scenario is, could there be a backward trend, a long-term backward trend? Well, of course, if that were to happen, well, a lot of investment would not happen in the Arctic, but still, the Arctic would remain a territory, a territory of innovation for many reasons. Going back to your, to, to your question on investments, well, you have three territories that are actually right now the ones who are capturing the most, uh, most of the investments for the Arctic. Of course, there's the Russian coast. The Russian coast, the investments are geoeconomically driven. That means they are driven by the state to the private. Then you have America, Canada, in, on, in which, in the mining sector, the hydrocarbon sector, and so on, you have a private initiative because there is a market. And then you have other kind of areas in the Arctic, like Greenland or like Iceland, in which you have kind of a mixed approach. There is a top-to-bottom approach in some, in, some sec in some sectors, and there's a private initiative in other sectors. So that's what we see. There's not a dichotomy, but a trichotomy when it comes to uh, investments in the Arctic and the way they come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, on back to the uh, indigenous issue and the uh, sort of public-private sort of partnerships. And I was wondering, uh, uh, because if we look at the investments here going on in Iceland and what I can tell is happening in Greenland, uh, what people can actually learn is usually coming in from the outside. We don't have the necessary expertise to venture into new industries. So uh, <laughs> I'm part of the indigenous population here in Iceland. So uh, I'm... Uh, at least to me here, it's, it's very appealing to see uh, internationals coming in and participating so this transfer of knowledge can take place and we can actually grow into new industries. Uh, do you have a view on, on, on how that happens elsewhere in the Arctic? Lawrence? Um, well, you put your finger on a, yet another real challenge for this region and that is education and access to, to educated skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. And the, um, if you look at the northern populations, the, the Nordic countries are in great shape. We have good universities, a highly educated workforce. But you look around the rest of the circumpolar north, and there's just a, a real problem there. And the, the young people are um, not staying in town. They're, they're moving south. They're moving to the, to the big cities. And how are we to, um, how is, is this, are some of these visions to actually be realized? when uh, this is happening. So it's a key issue. Lawson? Just to add that we probably need new funding mechanisms, new <coughs> opportunities for funding, particularly infrastructure in coastal Arctic communities, uh, new, new venues and new areas where this funding can take place in, in a cooperative Arctic uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, there was some uh, mentioning by the, the, the the gentleman from OECD, Mr. Kuria, that uh, there was an abundance of oil uh, now, and we should sort of do away with fossil fuels altogether. After reading your book, Lawrence, uh, that's not quite the conclusion you came to. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, sure, it's not the conclusion. It wasn't my conclusion. It's just a simple looking at the, the facts of reality. I mean, look, we all want a carb. We all would love, who, who in this room would not love to see a truly carbon neutral planet where we've removed our dependence on oil, for example, so that we're no longer burning this amazing resource, but uh, actually reserving it for the, 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 poly the plastics and polymers of the future. There will come a day when our descendants will go, you burned it for heat? This is, so 
it, who doesn't want that? But when you look at the near term, in the next several decades ahead, there's just, it's very uh, unrealistic to see a way in which we can fully wean ourselves off of these, these, this dependency in the near term. You know, just a reality of, of in the Arctic, we have uh, two Arctic states that, uh, where their GNP is, is tied to Arctic natural resources, particularly oil and gas in Norway and Russia, and other Arctic states that are, that are moving in that direction. So to sense that, uh, that you could somehow cut that off and that development and that investment, particularly in oil and gas in the Arctic, uh, focused on oil and, and specifically, it is uh, maybe not in the realm of plausibility if you're talking scenarios. I might add something on that. We've been working extensively out of the global energy outlook uh, from BP. And what they say is that by 2035, uh, the market share of hydrocarbons in the global energy demand would, be, it would go down from 86% in 2014 to, to, um, to 81% in 2035. So I'm just going your way. Uh, this is a reality that we have to make sure we understand and we <laughs> apply it in our studies. Uh, I would add one more thing as well on what you just touched upon before. Uh, when it comes to social issues in the Arctic, education is one, but there are also many other things. Yeah, there is women's rights, there is um, suicide of the youth, uh, food insecurity, health. There are so many other things that are actually happening in the Arctic that are a bad thing for which people should you know, become activists for, uh, but they just don't because they believe that, hey, it's Canada, it's a developed country, you know, something's happening, this thing doesn't happen, there's no suicide in Canada, there is no problems of access to health in Canada, and so on. Uh, even in Iceland, I I've seen a survey uh, several years ago saying that 42% of women in Iceland uh, had experienced a sexual assault in some way. It could be from minor to a full-on rape. So I'm sorry to like, talk about this right now, but this is a major issue in the Arctic and across the Arctic as well. Yeah, but fortunately, at least what the Icelandic studies shows are that things are getting better. Yeah. These are real issues and they need to be addressed, but it seems that we're on the right path. But uh, just for the last few minutes, I would like to open the floor to questions, if there are any. Uh, yeah, there's one question here. If you could please introduce yourself and come with a short question, thank you. Um, Theo Kongsbach, uh, Nordic citizen and resident of uh, northern Iceland. Well, it's rather a comment. Uh, one of the problems is this idea of remoteness, that the Arctic is remote. I think one of the problems is that this is remote. The Arctic villages and the, the Arctic in itself is not remote. It's, it's we who have to learn to rethink what remoteness is, to think the metropoles are remote, not the small villages, they're not remote. So in a sense, we, if we should create, so that was a re reference uh, to, uh, to, to Kennedy, now we can take a reference to Martin Luther King, I have a dream. <laughs> but a dream is that the that, that, that Arctic should not be constructed on metropolitan models, but on village models, basically. As the president addressed this morning, we are like a village. But of course, it's just a metaphor. We are not a village. We are pre pretty metropolitan, and people here are pretty metropolitan in the way of speaking about that. Thank you. So, thank, thank you for that comment, please. Good morning. Is this working? Yep, yeah, it's working. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Rachel Johnston, University of Akureyri in Iceland. Um, I was very interested in the optimism in your presentation and all the opportunities the Arctic might be offering as, as change comes to us. However, your company is called Polar Risk, and I wondered if you might say a few words about where you thought the major losses might lie. You mentioned, for example, the possibility of settled agriculture in Greenland, and I wonder what that meant for the dog sledders who simply can't hunt when there's no ice. Thank yep. you. So I guess that's one for me. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to farming, uh, we think that well, what we've seen happening is that in Greenland you have a lot of people who now get to new kinds of farming. Basically, um, they can grow people grow bana bananas now in Greenland. So that's for a, substan that's for, uh, a domestic use, but over time, as um, many countries like, I don't know, France, uh, Germany, and so on, uh, build other kinds uh, of farming industries, well, Greenland could actually be supplemental and bring something else uh, to, the, to, the, to the global market. So that's just uh, on your example of farming. Uh, 
I forgot what your, the first part of your question was. I think it was about the risks, right? So of course, a company's bay is called polar risk because, well, it's polar risk, right? Obviously, that's not even a play on words. Uh, but it also means polar in Norwegian, if I'm correct. So what we try to say is that there are risks in the Arctic and there are obvious risk is risks in operating right now in the Arctic. And these risks can be operational risks. We're going to be seeing that in the shipping, mining sessions and all that. But uh, there are also many political risks. And that's what we, that's what we focus on. So in the report, uh, we have a specific uh, assessment of which industries are subject to what kind of political risks. Micro political risk or macro political risk? Well, you find the two across the Arctic, but from one country to another, or even from one region to another within the same Arctic country, well, you don't find the same risk. So I'm going to stick to that broad red answer. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I get the message that our time is up, so I just had time for one last question. Thank you. I also appreciated your optimism with the future, but I also work um, at the North Slope Borough School District as the director of curriculum. We are rewriting our curriculum for our students, but we have probably less than 214 year olds entering the ninth grade, their secondary school this year. And those students are not so optimistic about their future. And so my question to those who are talking about the economic and political development and even military development, what can such great powers as you do to help our students who are spread across 89,000 square miles of Arctic tundra. How can you, how can all of us come together to bring this sense of optimism and future to these students who want to continue to subsistence hunt, want to live in their villages, do not want to leave and go to the university, but they like using their iPhones and they like using their computers. And so they have both the technology and the traditional ways of being. How can we bring those students with us without destroying their traditional ways? If you start, Mika. Just a short answer. Um, we have to be, the best answer is to be pragmatic. We cannot sell, sell dreams to people. We have to be pragmatic in our approaches. We have to be pragmatic on, when it comes to our numbers. And we have to say, this is possible, this is not possible. So that is the, thing, uh, the key thing, I believe, in the Arctic discussion right now. Last comments? Uh, I would just add, um, expanding the example, uh, you, I think you said you come from the North Slope Borough where yeah. things perhaps are tough, but actually uh, in, at the circumpolar scale, uh, Barrow has been a, a real success through um, its regional corporation, land claim settlements, and there, there is some brightness of future there for people that is not shared by um, some indigenous peoples of the, the Siberian of East, in Russian Far East, for example. So spreading of the, some of these models to other parts of the Arctic would be beneficial to, to many young people. Yeah, just a quick point that relates also to the first uh, question. Uh, the, the Arctic is no longer remote, and these communities are not remote in this connected world. Maybe they are physically or geographically, but even that is, is suspect. So the, the, this new connection uh, provides new opportunities for all the students, and they're connected too. So that information flow will change uh, many perspectives around the whole of the Arctic. Okay. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for a very interesting and good discussion. So, thank you. Thank you.